Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about the log for shell vulnerability, which has you know, just recently come out. Um, I had a bunch of questions in my stream, which were like, what, what is this? What does it mean? And I wanted to break it down into terms that should be basically understandable by anyone uh, and give you some best advice on how to move forward. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm going to start by talking about what log4j is. And uh, log4j is a logging library. It is, I think, the most popular logging library. At least it was last time I wrote a bunch of Java. And this means that a lot of applications use log4j. You can basically expect that if you're running Java, you are probably running some library which is using log4j to do its logging. Um, it's, you know, it's ubiquitous and extremely popular. And uh, it's open source and it's been around for decades. Uh, and, you know, since, since Java is, uh, fairly popular, you're going to have quite a few things that are running log4j. And so, you know, over the next couple of days, you're probably going to have lots of software updates. And if your company isn't already trying to mitigate this, they're probably scrambling to, uh, upgrade everything and make sure that they're not running this version. All right. So the next thing that we have to talk about in log4j and log4show is JNDI and kind of explaining what that is. Uh, admittedly, the documentation for JNDI is not that thorough. It doesn't really go into a lot of the details here. Um, it really just talks about, you know, you have a Java application, you use the JNDI API, and that integrates with these external services. It doesn't really talk about the scope of just how wild JNDI is, or at least how wild it would seem in the modern day. JNDI, again, has been around for a really long time. You know, modern clouds are relatively new, and you know the, the models of security that we've designed for today are very different than the ones that may have existed even five or 10 years ago, uh, where it was fairly common to you know, plop some binary of enterprise software on some machine, and that would never connect to the internet, never connect outside of the network. And so the, the threat models were very different then. Uh, but let me kind of show you how I think about JNDI. Um, so we have a little, a little paint diagram here. Uh, the way JNDI works is you have your main Java program here, uh, and this is independent of log4j. This is just JNDI is a separate technology from log4j. Uh, and what your Java program, and, and admittedly this was much more common back then, not as common today, hopefully not as common today, uh, your Java program may have shipped with some, you know, very specific functionality that it needs to do, uh, but some company may need special behavior from that. And so what you essentially do in code, and this is not exactly how the code works, but you can kind of imagine it working this way, uh, you call some sort of JNDI function with a string. Usually this string refers to these little building blocks down here, which are external services. LDAP is the one that was called out most specifically in the vulnerability. LDAP is often used, often used for usernames and passwords and logins and managing sort of your, your user space of, uh, you know, a company. But LDAP is a generalized directory protocol and you can store whatever you want in there. Uh, and so what you would usually do with, with JDNI is you would call out to some sort of LDAP server, usually one that you own. So you know, on 10.0.0. whatever. Should move this down here. So, so let's say you know you you're running an LDAP server on this particular port, and you may access some uh, resource here. And what this resource represents is a bit of executable Java code. At least that's how you can think about it. I think more specifically, it's a class file or something like that. But uh, this lives on some external uh, LDAP server, and this lookup here is going to go to that LDAP server and pull down that binary blob and uh, instantiate that inside of the JVM. And that binary blob is going to contain some amount of code. Oops, that is not the squiggly line that I wanted it to be. There we go. Uh, and so, you know, you, you store inside of LDAP uh, a particular, you know, executable Java blob. You can kind of think of this as like, you know, java.exe. It's not actually an exe. It's more like a code 
a class file that gets loaded into the Java virtual machine. It's not an actual executable, uh, but you can basically think of it as an executable. Um, I don't know, we'll call it java.class so that it's slightly less. It's, it's not actually that, but you can think of it that way. And what this uh, JNDI call does is it pulls that object into the JVM and executes it. So this could be used as like a dynamic plugin system. Think of it like, you know, I've downloaded this enterprise software. Uh, I don't need to update that software, but I can customize its be behavior by injecting my own custom code into it. Or at least that's the idea. This kind of idea is a little bit insane in, uh, in modern software. You usually don't want to reach out to the network to pull code down. Uh, you know, RPC magic like that is a, a little bit a little bit concerning, uh, but this is JNDI. You know, this this was much more necessary in a in a previous age of programming. Um, okay, so that's JNDI, and you know, there's many other plugins rather than LNAP. Like you can see here, you could even use DNS, or I don't know what these other ones are, uh, but you could use some other naming interface plugin to store this uh, JNDI data. So you know, this may not be LDAP, but it could be any other thing. In the particular vulnerability in log for shell uh, they call it LDAP and LDAP-S, which I believe is the um, SSL equivalent of, of LDAP. But... Okay, so that's JNDI. We've, also we've already talked about log4j. Let's talk about the CVE itself. So the CVE itself is this one here. I'm not going to read this, uh, but the, the TLDR of it is when logging, so if we go back to here, our Java program, this is usually an explicit piece of code that does this. Um, but in log4j, there are a bunch of placeholders. And so let's actually just make a new, make a new paint diagram. So in log4j, uh, you might have like log.warning. This is not the exact method because uh, I, I don't know the exact method. I haven't worked with log4j in a while. Um, you might log some sort of data like this, uh, you know, something maybe common like, um, I don't know, the user agent. You maybe are a web app. Uh, let's see, so probably not warning. It would probably be info in that case. <laughs> um, request user agents, and maybe you would substitute in the request user agent or something like that. Uh, this is this is of course nonsense code. Uh, of course, in Java, it would probably be user agent or whatever. Uh, but you can imagine a log request like this. Uh, Log4j supports a bunch of different substitutions inside of this string. And one of the ones that it supports is a substitution that looks like this. Um, JNDI and then LDAP and then, you know, similar to what I had listed before with some hosts and, you know, some string here. And what, what log4j will do with this substitution here is it will do a lookup uh, using JNDI, similar to what we did here with, with our JNDI lookup, against this LDAP resource, pull down that blob, execute it, and then insert whatever the result is into this string. So it's basically a string placeholder. Um, and this could allow you to customize the logging behavior at runtime without having to recompile the code and without having to change you know, whatever's going on in there. Uh, you can just kind of adjust this here. Uh, but as soon as you allow any user controllable content, such as you know, user agent, chat messages, like for instance, Minecraft was vulnerable to this. You could type this, this sort of string into chat and the log4j machinery would pull down <laughs> this, this particular blob and execute it. Um, but yeah, basically anytime you allowed user generated content into this string, it could uh, take these placeholders and execute them which is a big problem. You really do not want to allow uh, user accessible <laughs> uh, content to execute code. That's why it is a remote code vulnerability. Uh, but if we look in kind of a, a blob diagram of how this would work, you could imagine you're running either your server, say this is minecraft.jar or whatever, um, and you could have a malicious, so we'll call it this, I don't know, Reddish, I guess that's pink, whatever. <laughs> this is a malicious, uh, malicious LDAP server that the attacker controls. Uh, so this is controlled by the attacker. And then the attacker, need all they need to do is issue some sort of request to, oh, I did the squiggly line wrong again. They need to issue some sort of request to this server here 
which contains that little string. So if we you know, assume that this string was sent by, by that, that request here, let's do this in its parent. Oops. Yeah, so let's say the attacker sends this here. Uh, maybe this is in a chat message in, in game or something like that. Now this server is going to interpolate this JNDI string, call out to this uh, LDAP server here that the attacker controls, pull down the malicious code here, and run it directly in here. And as soon as they, you know, as soon as you're running arbitrary code, you can do all sorts of stuff, you know, steal whatever information is running on the server or, uh, you know, infect other people or infect other servers and control other stuff inside the network. You know, when you have arbitrary code, you can basically do anything. And so this is kind of the basics of how this vulnerability works. Um, so the the next question that most people have is like, this, this JNDI thing is insane. How did this possibly get into Log4J? And I, I kind of heart back a little bit to, you know, programming was a very different thing five, 10 years ago. And uh, you know, Log4J is an open source piece of software. And so people send requests to it all the time. And Log4J has all sorts of different other lookups already. So if you uh, look at the logs or the docs for their lookups, you see there's you know date formatting, there's specific stuff for Docker, there's environment variables, there's just like all sorts of stuff that you can look up. You can look up stuff about the Java runtime. There's of course the JNDI bit, which is the problematic one. You can look up JVM arguments. There's specific stuff for Kubernetes in there even. There's all sorts of features that are built into Log4J for a crazy amount of things that are doing lookups here. And so admittedly, adding another one for JNDI is just another lookup. It's just another feature. There's already a bunch of them. So it's not super surprising that some feature like this was accepted. Um, and in fact, we can actually look at the original bug report that was created for this. This was back in 2013. And again, clouds were like brand new in 2013. The internet was a very different place. And uh, the security models were not exactly the same as what you would expect today. Enterprise Java was still like a huge thing. I mean, it still is a huge thing today, but imagining some, <laughs> some enterprise situation. Um, but yeah, this was just a issue, add JNDI lookup support. Uh, they even provided a full patch for this and you know, they linked to other lookups and were like, hey, you know, there's a whole bunch of them here. It'd be really nice if we could have this feature as well. Uh, they attached the patch, the maintainers reviewed it and merged it. Uh, the patch is actually very straightforward, pretty readable. You can see they added a new lookup here. Uh, this is the implementation of JNDI. So you can see this is where they do the JNDI lookup, this is very similar to the imaginary function that I wrote earlier today. Um, and yeah, basically we're able to get this into uh, Log4J and have it be a supported and released feature. And that's not all that surprising. Like if you look at the amount of lookups that Log4J has, there's a lot of complexity here and adding just a little bit of incremental complexity more was you know, not a big deal. Okay. So let's talk about mitigation strategies next. Like how do you prevent yourself from getting owned from this vulnerability? Um, if you're a user of software, the best that you can really do right now is pay attention to upgrades for software that you're using and make sure that you're updating them. Like if you're running a Minecraft server, restart it. If you're <laughs> running any sort of other Java software, try and get updates as soon as possible. Um, but from a server perspective, there's a kind of a couple of things here and I'm not gonna go over all of them and they will probably change over time. So this is you know, these are the mitigations that are in place today. There may be better ones in the future. Uh, the easiest one by far is to upgrade from Log4J to at least version 2.15.0. Uh, this has been disabled by default. You can still enable it if you absolutely need JNDI, which hopefully you don't, but uh, you may need it. Uh, and you can also disable some of the features in previous versions through a configuration or you can just compile, you can just remove this class. <laughs> you can remove this class from the jar entirely. So you can just avoid having that functionality just by cutting that part out. Uh, and it should still function properly. So these are some mitigations here. They're not perfect. Some other mitigations that I've seen as well. Uh, so if you imagine, you know, this is, let's, let's not make this a 
Minecraft server. Let's make this instead just like an HTTP server. Uh, oh, some HTTP server. And uh, let's imagine that this string is being sent as a user agent. Some mitigations that I've seen is uh, to take your load balancer, which probably exists between your servers and the external part, and just block any strings that contain uh, any requests which contain strings like this. Um, and I've seen a couple websites which have done this already. And I think this is what Cloudflare is doing uh, to protect their downstreams, basically saying, hey, if you send a request which looks malicious because it has this JNDI string in it, we're just going to drop your request, uh, usually with like a 406 or, or something like that. Basically just preventing the request from even getting to the server, uh, you know, in case it's easier to do that rather than upgrade some stuff that's vulnerable. So those are some of the strategies that I've seen before. Um, <laughs> and the other thing that I've heard a lot from this is like, man, what, what the heck? How, how, is, how is this okay? How did somebody get this committed in? And I don't know, this one, this one hits a little close to home to me because I am also an open source maintainer and I completely understand the perspective of the log4j maintainers here. They're doing this entirely in their in their free time. They're not paid to work on log4j. Uh, they, they do it, you know, it's essentially charity work. And, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity in log4j. It's very popular. It's existed for a really long time. So I, I, don't, I don't blame the maintainers whatsoever. Uh, but the other part about this is like, you know, we should, we should probably, uh, should probably start paying people a little bit better. <laughs> like, open source is somewhat unsustainable. I'm not to get into politics, but like, it makes a lot of sense from you know capitalist society why open source is proliferated, proliferated in this way. But I would love to see it change. Um, a year or so ago, I lost my job and I was trying to make open source work as a full time thing, and it didn't work out for me. So now I have a new job. But like. Yeah, I would love to make open source a sustainable source of um, income and make that a way to be, uh, you know, sustainable. But yeah, there's an XAC comic. I'm gonna not reiterate this here. Feel free to click through on that if you want. And uh, you know, I work on a lot of important software in the Python community. So if you feel like this is something you feel strongly about, you know, you could sponsor me as well here. Um, but yeah. That's kind of the the uh, overall thought that I had about log4j. Hopefully I explained how JNDI work, works and how this vulnerability works so you can understand it as well. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll see you around in the next one.